Bonjour and welcome, royal friends. I'm Princess Diane von Brainesfried, and as Karen said, I am a recent breast cancer survivor. And I have to thank you for joining me today because I got to tell you, kudos to you because I'm sure many of you are going through lots of challenges. And you know, it takes courage to try to keep your smile when you're going through challenges. So you should be proud of yourself. And uh, I think that's amazing. I'm really excited to be here today as well because um, I'm excited to show people that you don't have to lose your smile. You don't have to lose your happiness mojo when something traumatic like breast cancer hits you. So um, that's why I wrote Bonjour Breast Cancer, I'm Still Smiling, available now at your nearest East Brunswick Library <laughs> and Amazon. <laughs> And I have to give a big thank you to Karen Perry because, oh my gosh, your generosity in providing books for everybody, that blew me away, I have to tell you. Oh my gosh, and what she told me made me really feel so good because she said to me, and I quote, a program about cancer that makes people laugh and feel good would be awesome. So, and then there's Kathy Chern, consumer health librarian I need to thank because she really helped coordinate all the pieces together. And then Chris Barnes, who did these amazing flyers out there. They're incredible, that rich purple and wow. So that was really good. And then I have to thank you to my BFF, Marla Super Caymans, for bringing my book to Chris's attention. So really thank you so much. So a few palace housekeeping notes. If you haven't done so already, there's the sign-in list there. And again, if you're on that list beside the book, I can then keep in touch with you. I have a blog. Um, uh, it's a really funny princess point of view for a lot of uh, for good things to, to make life better. And then um, I can keep you up to date with what I'm doing. And um, afterwards, if you are so moved to give a testimonial, that would be absolutely incredible. And I have some testimonial sheets over there with a pen. So here we go. So nothing prepares you for handling a diagnosis of breast cancer. And for those of you who've been through it, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. So one minute you're trucking along, minding your own beeswax, and the next minute you're basic, basically falling down a rabbit hole and you're facing life-threatening uh, life -threatening, a disease, often physically scarring, you frightening treatments like chemo, mastectomy, radiation, baldness. It's just a frightening situation. And I like to say it's one big sloppy fear sandwich with a fried order of with a side order of fries <laughs> <laughs> and cries. When it happened to me, I wondered, where the heck do I put my mind? to handle all of this? How do I not sink into despair? How do I handle this tsunami of fear, uh, fear of disfigurement, of pain, fear of nausea, and it turned out fear of fear, which basically fear has a shape. And mostly, I was terrified, would I lose myself? Would I ever be happy again? So what's a princess to do? <laughs> and the first step is hidden in the story of the Zen master and the hot dog vendor. A Zen master comes to New York City and decides he wants to try a hot dog. He had never had one and he heard they were amazing. So he goes up to a street vendor and the street vendor, he orders the hot dog and the vendor hands them the hot dog and the bun and relish and mustard, the whole works. And then he hands it over to the Zen master. The Zen master takes out a little purse and he takes a $20 bill and he gives it to the street vendor. The street vendor takes the $20 bill, puts it in a little tin box, closes the lid, and puts it to the side. Now, the Zen master has heard about New York and inflation and everything, but he figured 20 bucks for a hot dog, that can't be. So he says to him, sir, where's my change? And the street vendor says to him, don't you know, change happens from within. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't make that up, I heard that somewhere. But the thing is, what I do is I make connections to things. So <laughs> my royal friends, learning to have more positivity for beating the breast cancer blues is just like that. It's really an inner process. It's like anything else, if you want to lose weight, if you want to learn a new language, you know, if you want to learn to sing. It's a process that starts from within. 
So as I, and I, this is an interesting thought I had. Actually, it's not even in the book yet. I'm going to be writing about it. An interesting thought about how to give you a framework to hang on to when I go through this presentation. So this is kind of new. I'm trying it out on you. <laughs> as I talk to you tonight about my breast cancer journey and how I got to the other side of despair, I'm going to pull back the curtain on my process because it is a process. And as I show you my process, I wanted to give you an easy mnemonic. And if you try to spell that with a spell checker, I'm telling you, it's really hard. <laughs> I came up with that mnemonic with the letters D-A-S-H, which obviously spells dash. And it stands for decision, action, strategies, and then habits. So I realized that when I was first diagnosed with breast cancer, I was going to have to survive this thing, not just physically, but I was going to have to survive mentally as well as emotionally. And in order to do that, I needed to make a decision that I wanted to find a way to break out of the chains of fear and despair. After all, I could have stayed wallowing. I could have stayed in what I call a princess pity party. I could have stayed victim oriented, but that's not the kind of party that I want to go to. And I decided I didn't want to change, I didn't want to stay there and I needed to make a change from within. So once I made that, so that's the D, you make a decision. And once I made the decision, I needed to take the next step, which is action. For example, um, if you want to lose weight, that's an easy one. You, make a decision, it's a great first step, but if you just make a decision and you don't do anything about it, you don't take action, that scale ain't gonna move and your clothes are still gonna be too tight. So maybe you know, so you take action, you go to Weight Watchers, you do the keto, whatever they're doing now, but action is the next step for progress. And it's the same for learning to find a positive mindset. But here's the thing, with weight loss, it's kind of easy to know what to do for action. You find a plan that you like and you work it. But how does a person take action to find positivity when faced with trauma? And I asked myself, what was the action I was going to have to take? Now here's the secret. As the days went by, I realized I was going to have to see this whole crap sandwich with new eyes. I was going to have to see it in what positive psychologists call, I'm gonna to have to reframe it in some way. So I started asking myself, is there another way to look at the situation? Can I, can I learn to see with positive eyes? And I'm here to tell you, yes, you can. I did, so can you with a tr any kind of trauma, and so you must. And in a little while, I'm gonna, give you a taste for how seeing with new eyes or reframing is one of the most essential skills you will ever learn for finding happiness when, what, when life is not acting like a bowl of cherries, but instead like Rocky Road ice cream. Now, I once had a yoga teacher named Vinny, and she was a breast cancer survivor, and she told us, it's not what's happening to you that's important. It's what you tell yourself that's happening to you that's important. And now I realize, years later, that what my yoga teacher was talking about was really reframing or seeing with new eyes. So, okay, you say, Princess Diane Von Brain is fried. I'm willing to make a decision to be the hot dog vendor Zen master and make a change from within. And I'm willing to take action and see with new eyes. And now I call it, this is the next thing, it's my big butt. And I think that was a Pee Wee Herman thing. The big butt is, but how? So many people will tell you what to do, but they don't tell you how to do it. And this is what I talk so much about in Bonjour Breast Cancer, I'm Still Smiling. I talk about so many things for the how of becoming positive in the face of a trauma like breast cancer. And now I'm talking about the third letter in DASH. First you had decision, then you had action, but now you have S. Can anyone guess what that S is? Yes, yes, strategies. For example, when I first started taking opera lessons, and this is true, long time ago I had a teacher who used to say, and I say, I'm a soprano, a lyrico spinto. And he used to say, you have to get your epiglottis down. Now, I had no idea what my epiglottis was, let alone try to get it down, you know? Like, well, my teacher says I have to, so I, I didn't know what to do. 
Now, years later, I had these wonderful voice teachers never mentioned the word epiglottis, but they gave me strategies to do the how of what this guy had wanted me to do. They would say stuff like, think of, you know, yawn inside, that opens the back of your throat, or, or think of a little smile, or one person said, you know, think of your, the inside of your mouth like a, like a church steeple. These are all strategies. You needed to know the how, and that's super important. Um, and here's, and same with weight loss, let's say. God bless you. You decide to lose weight and you found, I love examples because they help you kind of remember and hang on to what I'm talking about. So you find a plan that's good, right? And you eat three squares a day and maybe cut down on the croissant, which is really my weakness. But what happens when the snack attacks come, right? What do you do? So I remember in college, uh, I would be studying my princess past, God bless you, studying my princess posterior off, right? And um, I, maybe I ate dinner and I'm tired and I'm grumpy and I'm scared and I got papers up the wazoo. I got exams coming. And what, what do I hear rolling? What do I hear down the, the hallway? Student snack. <laughs> he has this pile of candies and all these goodies. And, you know, like it's 10 o'clock at night. How can you resist this stuff? So the guy has a business of this cartload of fattening foods just when your willpower is at it, Lourdes. So what do you need to resist? You need strategies, right? So maybe I have an apple in my room with some honey or maybe, so instead, I, instead of grabbing a Hershey bar or one or two or three from the stupid cart, or maybe I stick my head under the pillow, or uh, maybe I study in the library instead of my room, or maybe we girls get together and pelt him with tomatoes. Anyway, we needed a strategy to deal with the student snack cart. So it's the same way with trying to learn how to be positive. It's strategies that you need. Um, so, so, um, we work our, so we have our decision, we have our action, and we learn strategies. But then what is, what's the H in dash? What, do you have, what has to happen? Yes, they have to become habits. And they naturally do once you work them over and over again. But singing habits, weight loss habits, positive thought habits, the process is the same, and that's what I'm really trying to get at, that it actually is a process, like any other thing that we try to do, this, this change in our mental state. And these good habits bring you across the goal line of successful transformation. So before I continue, continue and bring you some of my strategies that you'll find in Bonjour Breast Cancer, I'm Still Smiling, I figure you might be a little curious about my royal background and how I found out I was a princess. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> You're either going to look really stupid or like, okay. <laughs> So I only recently found out I was a princess. Yes, a princess descended from the hapless burger empire. I learned this shocking detail after I discovered an ancient coat of arms on my father's side of the closet. But I assure you, I get the legs from my mother's side. <laughs> Thus began my life as a princess. And when I'm not smashing bottles of champagne over the bows of ships or curling my pinky finger having tea with the queen or learning new techniques for anchoring my tiara without bobby pins, it's exhausting. <laughs> I'm also a motivational speaker, a certified positive psychology life coach, and under my alias, Diane Young Uniman, I'm a lawyer turned writer of screenplays and musicals, opera singer, hence how I learned all those strategies, wife, mother, a new grand-mère, a francophile, a French dog bulldog, a French bulldog obsessionist, and none of that is in, actually in any kind of order. <laughs> Please know, this is important, that I'm not a doctor, nor a therapist, nor social worker, nor any other kind of licensed healthcare worker, or IST, or that, or whatever, so. So nothing that I say is any kind of medical advice. So I never intended to write a book about my breast cancer experience, actually. 
uh, my brother suggested that I do it because he knew that I wrote, but I told him I'd rather write about hemorrhoids than about my breast cancer experience because I just wanted to put my head down and get through it. And I thought that if I'm writing about it, I thought actually that it was going to go against all the things of positivity because I was writing about positivity before I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I thought that was going to be dwelling, you know, and I thought I shouldn't be doing that because I'll be dwelling, you know. And I just wanted to like go forward and that was it. But something interesting happened. As I faced each challenge <clears throat> that happened to me and I was actually dealing it with it with positivity and optimism and finding ways to do that, and I was having epiphanies and insights, I realized that I was going to forget what I was learning. And if I didn't write it down, I would be basically reinventing my own wheel. So I decided I'll write it down. And then after a while, I saw that I had so much that it really became a calling that I, I knew I have to write this down and get this out to people because I was helping myself so much that uh, I, I needed to do that. And that's what happened. This is, you know, uh, it's not even a labor of love. It's just love. So, um, so, uh, here, so I found that the most logical way to kind of guide you through some of the strategies and epiphanies that I had was use my breast cancer journey. My husband always laughs and goes, journey. Everybody says journey, but I don't know a better word, you know, uh, to kind of show you what happened and what I was learning as I did it. So I'll, here we go with that. And I want to tell you too, there's so much of a spiritual stuff in the book that I didn't have time to put in here because this is, you know, hopefully just an hour of keeping you captive here. But there's a lot of stuff that has to do with spirituality. <clears throat> uh, and I'm not even, I'm not talking about religion that was incredibly helpful. So I just wanted to let you know about that. And the reason it toggled my brain on that is because this particular day that this happened was one of my best friends who passed away birthday and there's so many signs of synchronicity that happen throughout it so those would blow your mind if you you will you'll be able to read them because you'll get the book um, but so that the significance of that was at my girlfriend's birthday so on a gorgeous sunny day on January 26 2016 after a routine mammogram I mean isn't that always the case I had a routine mammogram well yeah it happened to me the tech who did the image returned with an air of concern. The doctor had seen something on the film and she wanted me to have a sonogram to decide whether we're dealing with a mass or a cyst. And she explained to me that a cyst, as opposed to a solid mass, was like a liquid. <laughs> and the way she described it, I mean, here's my food illusion. It reminded me of one of those, you know, those chocolate-covered cherries that you get, like, at gas stations that are wrapped in that gold foil. You know, you bite into it and the cherry and the ooze. That's what I'm thinking when she's telling me about the cyst. So I love those things, you know. Well, that's what I'm picturing. And I'm slightly nervous, but I'm not pushing the panic button. I've been down this rodeo before, and I'm sure a lot of you women have. You know, they some see something, and oh my gosh, and all the bells are ringing, and it's nothing. And besides, the idea of having breast cancer is just too far out, right? Breast cancer's over there, right? And I'm over here. Like, breast cancer's in somebody else's kingdom. So they took me to a dark room and they do the sonogram. And I'm watching the text face, you know, the way you watch the, uh, an airline uh, hostesses or hosts, what is it, airline attendants face during jet turbulence, like you're looking to see, like, are they scared, right? So I'm looking for signs of distress. And I can tell that the ultrasound was not going so well because I see uh-oh on the text face. So I'm saying, fasten your seatbelt. There's some turbulence. So I'm starting to feel just the beginning rumblings of volcanic panic. The first very hot molten jolts of fear. And the nurse comes back and the verdict is in. This is no chocolate covered cherry with liqueur in the middle. I do not have a cyst. This is a solid mass and I'm going to need a biopsy. And later it turns out they're serving up more bad news because the doctor comes in, clipboard in hand, and again, I'm trying to read facial expressions and I see, uh-oh, on her face. And then the doctor oh, utters two little words that strike daggers in my heart. 
anyone know what those two little words are that might be the most dreaded words in the doctor's office? <laughs> Good for you. Exactly. I'm sorry. What is it? Like, I'm sorry what? You ran out of creamer. You're sorry you're late. I'm, you know, like, what are you sorry? I'm sorry because you're going to fall down the rabbit hole just about now. But guess what? Turns out there are two other words that are just as dreaded when uttered by your doctor. Does anyone know what those are? Almost, it's positive. And but because since when did positive become a negative thing, right? I mean, that's ridiculous. But I'll tell you when, since the time it's positive, got to have the words, I'm sorry in front of it, right? So I'm finding out that it ends up that this isn't the, I don't know if I'm saying this right, the in situ kind that likes to hang around the breast. It's not. It's not the homebody breast cancer, no. It's the wild child kind, the invasive kind, the kind that likes the scenic route. It likes to travel other parts of your body. It likes to get out of town and see the world. It's the kind that tries to kill you. So what are the very first thoughts going through my head when I'm diagnosed with breast cancer? Now, you have to pinky swear that you don't tell anybody what hap What I'm going to tell you now, because it's really embarrassing considering my situation and the gravity of it. <laughs> the first thing that goes through my mind is, what is all this stress going to do to my face? <laughs> Never mind death. <laughs> right? I'm a princess after all, right? But... You know, but seriously, what's, what's actually flashing through my mind were the photos of U.S. presidents, you know, like before and after their office, like Lincoln, you know, like that's what's going through my mind. And I'm thinking like, I, I'm actually, and then here's the thing, I knew I had to hurry up. This was the impetus. I had to hurry up and find a solution to the stress because I'm already worrying about the effects of worrying. So here's the D in dash. What did I have to do? I had to make a decision to make a change. So here's my second thought after I realized I gotta do something about all this stress. I gotta wrap my finger, I gotta figure this out. <clears throat> and I'm thinking, where the heck do I put my mind to handle all this stress and fear? That's really the deal, like strategy, right? Action, because nobody tells you how to handle this stuff. I mean, you are alone, you're in a, you're in a sinking ship you know, and you got the finger in the hole, that's it. I'm thinking, you know, death, disfigurement, baldness, puking over a porcelain throne, a whole lot of pain and ugly. And I'm starting to think, you know, will the doctors be able to cure me? Will I, this is a big one, I didn't have grandchildren at the time. Will I live to even have, you know, play with grandchildren? Will no one remember me in the next generation? I, I had a grandparent that I never met and I actually sometimes talk to him because I feel like he's so left out, I feel bad. You know, will I disappear into the ethers and be the grandmother that they never knew but died of breast cancer? Will I live to finish the projects I'm so passionate about? I have musicals, I have screenplays. Well, here's a big one. Will people shun me as a sick person? I was worried about that because I had heard that happens. Will I ever be happy again? I mean, this is my M.O. This is who I am. Will I, will I lose myself entirely? But, and then I knew I had to do something. So I knew I had to take the A in dash, which was action. Basically, I was so upset and frightened, and it was clear to me that uh, I, had to, I had to figure something out. So what I did was, and I, I recommend this to people, I did some what I call sustained thinking. I gave myself the grace of sustained thinking. I gave myself the grace of not having to figure it out. Just kind of set your sail to think about it, you know, really think, but don't feel frightened if you can't come up with the answers because so much happens in our subconscious mind. You know, they always say sleep on it. That's probably where that expression came from, sleep on it. Um, so, and then I had an epiphany after a while. I don't remember if it happened right away. It might have been a few days, but I had the epiphany and I heard this. You know that still small voice you hear deep inside or the crazy voice that you hear and they put you away? <laughs> I heard, if I let cancer steal my joy, then I've died while I'm still alive. 
And I realize that was step one out of this mess. If I let cancer steal my joy, then I've died while I'm still alive. That was one of the first of the many secrets of the keys to unlock the kingdom of happiness when you have breast cancer or facing any kind of trauma or tough life situation. Put it another way, I must choose to thrive for as long as I'm alive because who wants to be dead man walking? Socrates said, not life, but good life is to be chiefly valued. If I wanted to thrive while I was still alive, if I wanted a good life, that meant I couldn't let cancer steal my joy. So continuing on, at first the doctors thought I could get away with a lumpectomy, but after the after I had one, the pathology report showed that they couldn't get the margins clear. So they dove in there another few weeks later, I don't know, I had to recover, and then they, I did another, they did another lumpectomy. But the re pathology report on the second surgery showed that the margins weren't clear again. This thing was acting like sisterhood of the traveling pants. <laughs> and the cancer had already metastasized into my lymph nodes. So by now I'm terrified. I'm facing a mastectomy, chemo, baldness, radiation, possible death, fear is a foot. Well, actually not a foot, you know, it's fear, it's not a foot, but it's, it's around. <laughs> so how do I deal with all this fear that's becoming stronger and stronger as my fear is getting stronger and stronger, and my, I mean, things are getting worse and worse. And this is where the S comes in with the word dash. I needed strategies. So now I'm going to share with you some of the strategies for a positive, optimistic outlook. Many of them you'll find in Bonjour Breast Cancer. I'm still smiling, but a lot more are in there. These are super powerful for beating the breast cancer blues. And I used these strategies to help me see my situation with new, more positive eyes to help me handle the gripping fear that is many a breast cancer patient's new constant companion. So I'm going to go through some of the things. These are kind of random fun ones that I like uh, just to show you some different ways of thinking. So you've heard the expression watch your, ma your, wor watch your mouth. I like to say watch your words. What I mean by that, it's important to clean up your inner chatter. There is great power in words even the words you tell yourself. And that power can work for you or can work against you. And you should choose words that work for you, words that give you power. Because remember the yoga teacher, Binny, who said it's not what's happening to you that's important, it's what you tell yourself is happening to you? It's so true. To find our happiness mojo, during the breast cancer journey or any rough patch, we need to be careful what we tell ourselves is happening. So, for example, when I was first diagnosed with breast cancer, I could have said to myself, I have a really big problem. Well, yeah, you could totally look at it like that. But as a princess who knows the way of the Zen master hot dog vendor, I'm going to make the change from within and find another way to look at my circumstances. Look at the difference between these two words. Problem, challenge. It's like physically you actually have a change. A problem completely deflates you. A challenge energizes you. You rise to a challenge. There's like something physical that happens. And I'll tell you how I found out about this. I found out about this a long time ago. I discovered the power of your words to use for you or against you when I was working as a lawyer. And my boss gave me this legal assignment. Actually, what happened was I had just shoved a box of juji fruits in my mouth. You know, these open offices, even the black ones, which were my favorite. I could hardly talk. And he comes in and he hands me this thing, which was a problem, and I couldn't talk. So he goes out and leaves. I'm going to myself, I don't know. I'm looking at this. I don't even know what the issue is. I mean, you learn in law school the most important thing is issue spotting. I mean, this could have been a truck, a duck, a flag. I had no idea what it was, let alone how to solve this problem. And I really, I was really worried because you really can't hand something back to your boss and say, uh, nah, you know what, this is above my 
pay grade. And by the way, what about my raise? You know, it's not a good idea. But what's interesting, and I don't know how this happened, it was like a saving grace. Somehow an epiphany came over me to actually call this thing to myself a challenge and not a problem. I remember this so distinctly, and I remember something like physical happened inside. And I'll tell you the truth, I don't know. Within a very short time, I could tell the issues, I figured it out, and I could solve the challenge. So um, it was just a small change in, in perspective can like blow the top off your head. You just have to be careful if you're wearing a tiara. You know? <laughs> so I encourage you to look at breast cancer or other curveballs as challenges and not problems. Train yourself to use the word challenge instead of a problem. And here comes the H in the word dash, the habits. If you work this so much, if you say it over and over again, the way you change, it becomes a habit to use the word challenge instead of a problem. Um, so, and, if, and I, I can't always do it. Sometimes I forget. But the thing that I can do now is more times than not, I'll be able to do it, or I can recalibrate quickly and get back to seeing things as a challenge. So that's really the deal. It's not like I'm perfect. It's not like I can always do it. And that's, you're not aiming for perfective. You're aiming for better. You're aiming for better. And the idea is to, like off script here, what's your, what are your choices? You know, what are your choices? You want to sink? Don't do any of this stuff. You want to swim? Try. So, um, I'm a, I'm a princess positivity vigilante. <laughs> Here's another strategy of how you can watch your words and clean up your, clean up your inner chatter to help combat fear. And I learned this strategy from a very close friend of mine. And you'll notice I've been saying I've been diagnosed with breast cancer and not I have breast cancer. That's what she taught me. She said, use the word diagnose and not have. And it may sound like a distinction without a difference, as they say in law, but they're really two very different ways of looking at your circumstances. Again, that small shift that really can make you be able to solve the, the remember that when I made the small shift, I could solve a problem right? That I couldn't solve before when I called it a challenge. When you say I have, I have breast cancer, it's almost like you own the disease. You're like making it part of your identity. And it really makes you feel like you're a victim. And it helped me so much not to look at it like that, not like I owned it. And here's a good example. I learned this from my daughter-in-law. I had never heard of Rent a Runway. Maybe some of you have heard of Rent a Runway. If I order a ball gown from Rent-A-Runway Company, how would that work? The ball gown comes in a box. I put it on for the ball. When the clock sti strikes 12, the ball is over, and I return to my palace. I pack up the gown, and I send it on its merry way. So although I have the dress for a certain period of time, I don't really have it in that I don't expect to keep it. That's why they call it rent a, one, a rent a runway and not own a runway. When the clock strikes midnight, you got to give the dress back. In the same way, I don't want to look at breast cancer like I have it or I own it. Like the dress in the rent a runway box. One day, I'm sending that sucker packing. <laughs> So here are a few strategies for watching your words that I used for my various breast cancer treatments. This reframing helped me see the treatments in a positive light and saved me from going down the rabbit hole in a free fall of fear. So I don't think it takes too much imagination to understand the fear that strikes a princess's heart when facing a double mastectomy. There is such a confluence of fears and confusing emotions like issues of femininity, sexuality, identity, body image, self-worth. And I have to tell you, it really did help me a lot. My husband's here. He was incredible about it. He always made me feel lovely, and he still does, and never feels makes me feel like I'm less than. So that is very, very helpful to have good partners. So, But not everybody has that kind of helpful person you still comes down to how you, you have to learn to do it yourself too. Really you do. So I was afraid I actually might freak out about it, especially the night before the surgery. 
I, I really was saying to myself, how am I going to see this in a positive way? And my brother tried, and in the book there's a funny story of how I handled it. And I, I don't feel bad leaving you with a cliffhanger because you'll be able to read it. And someone, uh, I, I actually someone who was facing that happening, she, I told her about this and she read it in the book and she told me, oh my gosh, this helped me so much, you have no idea. So I'm excited because I think a lot of people will be able to use some of the funny stuff that I say about before the surgery to help them get through it. But just in general, how to like look at the mastectomy and how to deal with it. And um, my brother consoled me by saying, you know what, all the ladies in Park Avenue, they all have boob jobs, you know, you're just joining the club. <laughs> but then I had an epiphany about how to see this with new eyes, how to reframe, there's that positive psychology word, the situation with a positive spin and how I could watch my words. Instead of seeing the situation, as someone would say, the reality, which is I'm getting my knockers lopped off, I started seeing it as getting a brand new pair of Park Avenue boobs. <laughs> Make me a pair of stargazers, doc. <laughs> and then I felt like a victor and not a victim. That description of my physique sounded positive, maybe even lovely, as opposed to something scary disfiguring, even slightly barbaric, I mean, well, like really barbaric. <laughs> and speaking of barbaric, don't you have this feeling like years from now, doctors are gonna look back on how they treat us with these things and say like, we did that to them? It's kind of like how we look at leeches now, <laughs> you know, like we did that. Well, I have two little words to say to that. Hurry up. <laughs> Anyhow, that little shift in my inner chatter became like a magic mantra, Park Avenue boobs. It absolutely transformed how I saw what was happening to me, what I told myself was happening to me, and it saved me from drowning in fear and sorrow. And here's another strategy I implore you to practice. It's one of the most powerful tools that you can use and have in your silk embroidered pocket and that's humor. I cover the power of humor extensively in Bonjour Breast Cancer as a key strategy for positivity and optimism. But I found it's not so easy to employ humor when facing a traumatic experience. And here's something interesting that I found out. I discovered that sometimes you have to give yourself permission to laugh. I realized that it was an issue of giving myself permission. I mean, why should we give ourselves permission to try and find laughter, like little points of light in the face of trauma? Here's why. You've probably all heard the expression, laughter is the best medicine. Well, guess what? There's a lot of studies out there about the healing properties of laughter. Even the Bible backs it up. A merry heart doeth like medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones, Proverbs 17:22, and amen, princess sister. <laughs> but seriously, researchers have begun to dig into the issue of laughter and well-being, and so there's like research in um, uh, healthy adult volunteers in research project at the University of Texas watched a 30-minute funny video, and they had improvements in artery function, which lasted almost 24 hours. However, with volunteers who watched a documentary, they had a decrease in blood flow. And these findings were corroborated with another study at the University of Maryland Medical Center. So no worries, my royal friends. That doesn't mean that documentaries are gonna make you sick. It just means that if you think you're having a heart attack, after you call 911, tell Alexa to flip on the three stooges and not an inconvenient truth. <laughs> <laughs> and laughter increases endorphins released in the brain, which relieve stress and increases personal satisfaction. And studies have found that laughter therapy might even be an intervention for cancer when used in, with, addition, with you know, the conventional treatments as well with helping the healing process. So you watch, pretty soon making someone laugh is going to be considered practicing medicine without a license. <laughs> So, you know, humor, not just for the physical stuff that it helps you with, it helps you mentally and emotionally as well. It helped me so much. 
So when it was clear I needed chemotherapy, the doctor inserted a port in my upper chest for chemo transfusions. And later, when the doctors prepared my breasts for reconstruction, a port was inserted into each breast. So these things that they put on your chest called expanders can stretch your skin, but they like actually fill them with, I don't even know what the hell, they fill them with liquid or something, but they stretch your skin. So basically I ended up with three ports at the same time. And I used to tell people I have more ports than a horny sailor. <laughs> that helped me. <laughs> so, so as I was, this is one of my favorites. As I was being wheeled into the operating room before my double mastectomy, I felt like a lamb to the slaughter. I was really scared and nervous. I didn't, you know, talk about whistling in the dark. I needed a bullhorn. Finally, I just said to myself, princess, let's turn this crap sandwich in, that I'm facing into caviar and make it easier for everyone else, including myself. Here we go. And I just went for it. And I made up a song. And the doctors and nurses chimed in, and it went like this. Bye bye boobies, I'm gonna miss you so. Bye bye boobies, why'd you have to go? <laughs> gonna miss you so, why'd you have to go? <laughs> and we were singing, we were laughing, okay? I had the bullhorn, and that was that. <laughs> I can, you know, you don't need a copyright when there's a parody. <laughs> <laughs> my dad also used Huber to help us both deal with the mastectomy. <clears throat> my dad was a medical doctor, so he could see things with a clinical eye. And one day when I was visiting him, he says to me, you know what, about your mastectomy, it's really just like remo removing two big moles. <laughs> and I was like, hell's yeah, daddy-o, just two big moles. <laughs> But you know what? The good thing was that we had such a good laugh about it, and we both felt better. It was better for our psyche. And here's the thing. If you can laugh, it feels like how bad can everything be? We're laughing about it. It's just, it's such a healing balm. So, and again, in challenging times, we often feel that laughter isn't appropriate. And you know what I say to that? You know what isn't appropriate? Not surviving mentally isn't appropriate. So. Now here's a little, uh, I'm going to teach you, not teach you, tell you about some of the things from my heritage that help, helped me a lot. So my dad rightfully came by his sense of humor and his twin strategies of using both humor and perspective to beat back trauma and grief. My dad's great, no, my dad's grandmother is my great -grandma, grandmother, Dina Olean, and that's my namesake. She had her own take on facing tough times with humor. She was a Russian Jewish immigrant who faced plenty of hardship in her life. Dina lost a son, Isidore, as a World War I hero. He was killed in the Argonne Forest. I hear that it was like a day before Arm Armistice Day, but I'm not sure. It may have been, it doesn't even matter. He was killed days before Armistice Day. And that, of course, that's a terrible trauma for any parent. But Dina also lost a three-year-old baby girl to a fever and I looked it up at the time the baby girl died and I think it must have been the typhus fever that was going on around World War I. I mean so many people died from that and also she was widowed at a young age. So in spite of all these tragedies my great grandmother Dina knew she had to continue to leave, live and she used humor as a strategy and she used to tell my father if you can't laugh and my dad passed that wisdom on to me, and now I'm passing that on to you. Even when trauma strikes, you must give yourself permission to go on and still find areas of your life where you can continue to laugh and to smile or to live, because otherwise you die too. And then there's perspective. The wisdom of practicality and perspective from my dad's mother, Lena who was my grandmother, and that was Dina's daughter. Lena, Young, Lena Olean Young was an additional source of strength to me so much as I was going through my breast cancer journey. Now, in my book, I go through great detail about her and her fascinating story and the trauma that she endured with such grace and elegance. Her courage in life and her story 
helped me so much to have courage and face my mastectomy surgery. Lena, or mom as I called her, was always upbeat and full of good cheer. She was amazing actually. She was known in the family as the queen, but not because she was snobby. No, there wasn't a scintilla of snobbiness about her, but she was just known for her elegance and her grace and for her role as a peacemaker in the family. Not that we had a lot of strife, but like if any quarrel, I was told that Lena would be called in for the peacemaker. Now, this is funny actually, this part. My dad told me a story that Lena was once at some big banquet and some and apparently she wasn't seated at the head table and apparently someone, probably one of the troublemakers, said to her, so, Alina, aren't you upset that you aren't at the head table? And she replied, wherever I'm sitting, that is the head table. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> and she wasn't like that, but I might, she just must have had such composure, you know? So Lena passed away many years ago but as a young woman, she had been in a terrible car accident. She was behind the wheel of one of those 1920s old-fashioned cars, you know, where the steering wheels are huge. And my dad was about six at the time, and he does not remember the incident. I can't remember if he told me he was in the car or not. But in the accident, the wheel smashed against Lena's chest, and the surgeons had to remove her breasts. And I never knew about this accident until I was an adult and my grandmother had already passed. When I found out, I was stunned. Uh, and that's because she was never anything but upbeat. Uh, I, I, couldn't, she, I couldn't believe she had weathered such a trauma at a young age and, and you know, she, A, she looked totally normal and B, there was nothing about her that, you know, that you could smell that there was trauma or anything. She just was just Lena, amazing. And it, my Aunt Flora, who was her daughter, told me about this and said she used to wear these things they like to call fuffies to fill out her bra. Water closes over and life gets normalized. And this all makes sense about Lena not, you know, being the tragic heroine because, and that I never detected anything morose or blue about her uh, because she was so practical. That was one of the qualities that she was very famous for. And I want to pass on to you now what Lena always said that she taught my dad and that my dad passed down to me, and again, I'm passing on to you. When facing hardship or a difficult time, she would always say, we'll do what we have to do. I love that. Thinking of her and that phrase gives me so much courage, and please, let it give you courage too. I leaned on Lena's words when facing my mastectomy surgery, getting my head shaved before my hair fell out, and really, all through my breast cancer career, <laughs> we'll do what we have to do. The wisdom was, and still is so powerful, it's a powerful tool to help reduce the, the static of worry and fear in my head. Practical Lena, feet on the ground Lena, Queen Lena, don't ruminate, don't look what was, don't fight fate, don't look back, or like Lot's wife in the Bible, I'll become a pillar of salt from my own tears. And in the end, I'm just going to do what I have to do. And I'm recounting these stories to you not only to import the wisdom that I learned from my great grandfather mother, from my grandmother, and from my father that I used to help me get through this rough patch, but also to illustrate that our guides don't necessarily have to be earthbound. Our guides can be people who are no longer with us, but continue to inspire. Wherever inspiration can be found, grab it, use it, and pass it on. Now, chemotherapy was another treatment that could use an overhaul in words that you use to tell yourself. So here's what I did to use positive psychology strategy of reframing what was happening and to put a positive spin on what was happening. On the days that I was scheduled to go to chemotherapy, I didn't say I was going to my chemotherapy. I said I was going to my spa treatments. Exactly. I even wrote it in my calendar, spa treatments. Spa treatments, chemotherapy, the, you know, the difference is unbelievable. Here's what it is. I told you I write screenplays. Well, guess what? 
You get to decide how to write the script of your life. You get to decide what to tell yourself is happening. The only problem is every time I go to a spa now, I get hives. <laughs> Here's another example of strategy of reframing your words and watching your words. So part of my treatment that I ended up having is with my particular kind of breast cancer is I have hormone therapy and actually I'm lucky to be able to have that. It's I take an estrogen blocker. Now before I started taking them a dermatologist friend of mine told me he'd seen many women taking estrogen blockers and it really wreaks havoc on their skin very aging, very horrible, and that really upset me and worried me. You go through so many things, so many assaults, like, here goes another one. Now this stuff that's trying to keep me alive is gonna make me, you know, like, do another thing on me. So, but listen, when you're a princess who's been wearing sunscreen of about SPF 5,000 since she was 15, rain or shine, right? Like I wear this stuff to bed, God forbid the stars, <laughs> life of the stars, or the lamp, table light, you know, gets me now, and now I'm facing this, you know. I have all these years of staying out of the sun and, and the stars in my lamp table, you know. Never mind that I was worried that the estrogen blockers were going to give me whiskers. I fear I can shave, you know. <laughs> but remember, we're in the Zen Master hot dog vendor business. Change must come from within. So I asked myself, how could I look at my situation differently? Because every, you know, refill, I got a new bo bottle of these things, a new bottle of this assault in my mind. So what could I do to make it seem different, to make it seem positive that might uplift my spirits? And here's what I did, and I still do. I take a purple Sharpie and I write on the pill bottle, youth and beauty pills, on the label of each body. Why not? It's empowering. It's princessy. We get to choose how we look at life. Get creative. Every night before I go to bed, I take a youth and beauty pill. Here's another really, really good strategy to use. <clears throat> In order to gain perspective, when I was having to go through a lot of treatments and the insults again that came with them, like the mastectomy or like being bald or like screwed up toenails from the chemo, which is unbelievable, I made up a princess chant to bang that perspective into my head in a way that my tiara wouldn't fall off. It's my princess magic chant, and I'm happy to share it with you. You see, perspective became one of the most powerful strategies in my treasure, treasure chest of positivity, and I made sure to work it enough to create the H in dash, a habit. The magic princess dash goes like this, and I'm going to ask you to repeat it after me once I tell you what it is. It goes like this, yebit, 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 I get to live. So on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to repeat it. One, two, three. Yebit, 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 I get to live. Let's do it again. Yebit, 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 I get to live. Fantastic. And I'll tell you how I use this. I use this magic princess chant whenever I get to feel like a palace pop-up pity party because of a side effect. For example, if I'm boo-hoo-hooing in the mirror because I'm bald, I say to myself, okay, I'm bald, but yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, I get to live. Or when I'm, you know, in the August heat and the, I'm schwitzing because my wig that I have on is driving me crazy, I start, you know, boo-hoo-hoo, and I say, wait a minute, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, I get to live, you know, or, um, you know, or, or my, even now, my toes are killing me, sometimes still, I got, it's still screwed up from that, and I'll be, oh, I can't wear the shoes I want to this thing, I have to wear these dumb shoes, and I'm wearing this nice dress, and then I remember, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, I get to live. It really helps me because it pushes me into the perspective, I'm complaining, but I'm alive. You gotta be kidding me. I say to myself, and it, it just helps so much. So that's a real, really good one. And my dad always used to say, you know, he remembers the guy who complained about not having any shoes until he saw the guy without any feet, right? And how appropriate, because I'm talking about my shoes. <laughs> I just thought of that. Perspective is king. Okay, but you say Princess Diane von Brain is fried. What if I just can't get the fear 
out of my head because you know what we're talking about. We can talk and talk and talk and talk sometimes and if that fear is gripping you, it's really hard to get out of your head. Yeah, you really, it just is. Let's be real about it. Um, it can be very overwhelming, very taunting, and uh, I remember one of my mentors used to say, he doesn't like to think too much because when he does, he goes behind enemy lines. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I've, I've got enemies. But I'd like to share a wonderful Cherokee legend that many of you might even know that addresses this issue. In this legend, a Cherokee grandpa wants to teach his young grandson, Little Beaver, about life. He tells his young grandson that in every person there is a terrible fight between two wolves going on inside of them. One wolf is an evil wolf and the other wolf is a good wolf. And the Cherokee grandfather explains to his grandson that the fight is in everybody. And the little boy looks up at his grandfather and says, Jeepers, Grandpa, <laughs> which wolf is going to win? And the Cherokee Grandpa says, the one you feed. What Grandpa really meant was the one you focus on. So the strategies I'm sharing today are food to feed the good wolf. Seeing with new eyes, reframing, watching your words, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but I get to live. Challenge versus problem, Park Avenue boobs, youth and beauty pills, spa treatments, all of these would get the Cherokee grandpa seal of approval to feed the good wolf. And my friend Fanny, who used to say that thoughts are like a muscle, what you focus on strengthens just like your muscle, right? You strengthen it. And if you let it go, it atrophies, it weakens. And I, I realized now what she was talking about was feeding the good wolf and starving the evil wolf. She, and she was also talking about creating a habit. So feed the good wolf with thoughts like, I am full of courage, I am resilient and able to handle anything. The doctors are working hard to save me. The doctors care about me and modern mer medicine is a miracle. My life force is continually working to keep me strong and healthy. We get to choose our focus and we get to choose how we look at life. Remember, the goal here is to keep your eye on the prize, beating the breast cancer blues. So I'm, I got a little bit more left here. Uh, so how do you handle the fear and uncertainty of not knowing if you're cured? This was a huge issue for me when I first was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and I'm going to touch on a strategy for your mind for how to handle the uncertainty of not knowing if you're cured. Um, some of my fears about dying were really worries about my kids and my husband and worry about their feelings and fears. And I also told you I worried about being the grandmother that no one knew, a fear of not knowing my grandchildren. I also mentioned the fear of not finishing my projects that I'm passionate about and that I feel are a life's mission. But there's also the fear of not getting to have any more fun on earthly time. Think about it. What heavenly earthly delights we get to have. A mimosa on a Sunday brunch with really, really, really good champagne. <laughs> the scent of juniper in a spring rain. Snuggling with our pets. Recreational eating with the family at new cool restaurants. Dancing up a storm at friend, with friends at celebrations. Browsing Sephora for that elusive yet perfect shade of lipstick that will make me feel like a million bucks. Come on, I can't check out before I find that. <laughs> well, luckily my prognosis for survival is very good. But really, a lot of my fears stem from the fact that I wanted to know if I was cured. And apparently, the, there's no real way to know if that I know of or understand that there's no test to know for sure, no magic wand or anything. And that blew my mind and that still does. Because you mean to tell me after all I had to go through, chemo, radiation, double mastectomy, four drains coming out of my pits like dog leashes, tattoos where my nipples used to be, total baldness, loss of eyelashes and eyebrows, four hour ice baths for my toes and fingers during chemo to prevent them from turning black, and then getting painful toenail infections, don't ask, and you don't know if I'm cured after all that? 
what I went through reminded me of the Pee Wee Herman movie, The Big Adventure. First hang him, then drown him, then shoot him, then kill him. <laughs> but then I had another epiphany for a way to see my situation with new eyes. You see, I wanted to hear from my doctors that I was cured. I was essentially asking for a guarantee that I would be okay. Well, guess what? No one's got a guarantee. It dawned on me that in asking the universe and the doctors for a guarantee that I would live, I was asking for something that does not exist. No one has any guarantees. No one has a lockdown on tomorrow. I realized all anyone has is now. I don't have any less than anybody else. And you want to know something else? In that way, breast cancer is a capital G, capital I, capital F, capital T gift. And right there, my royal friends, are two huge strategies for beating the breast cancer blues. Mindfulness, or living in the present moment, and the strategy of gratitude for the gifts that the journey of breast cancer was bringing me, and really just the gifts of every day. It has been said that everyone gets two lives. The first begins when we realize we only have one. The gift was the understanding, not just in my head, but also in my heart, a gut level understanding of how precious life is right now. You know that expression, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift, that's why they call it the present. Author, who knows. Today is truly a gift comprised of 86,400 seconds in the day granted to us from some mysterious, celestial, non-refundable, non-exchangeable gift registry. We must enjoy the present moment and everyone and everything in it because that's all we have. Now, this second, and we don't even know about the next one, and I'm really grateful for the power of that understanding because the depth of living, the new eyes that one has, really connecting the dots to this understanding. And the, there are lots more gifts that breast cancer has brought to me and I go over a lot of them in Bonjour Breast Cancer, I'm still smiling. But that shifted thinking, that new way of seeing was one of the most powerful insights of my breast cancer journey. And the insight of the gift of now really put optimism and positivity back in my heart because my new definition of being okay was being alive in the moment. And I have today, I know in this moment, I have everything and so do you. And this is really one huge reason why I'm excited to talk to you today because now you know all of this too. You know, they say carpe diem, uh, seize the day, or in my case as a princess, carpe diadem. <laughs> and if you really want to know something mind-blowing, breast cancer transformed my life for the better in so many ways that I would not trade the experience for anything, and I mean that. So any of you out there, if you have fear about it, or if you know people who have fear, spread that word, because I am so afraid that the fear will be keeping people from you know, taking care of their health, getting mammograms or whatever. Please do not let fear stand in your way. There is a way through this. There are so many gifts. There's a lot of positivity and there's a lot of great medicine out there and there's a lot we can do with our own minds to help us. So when I was first diagnosed, the phrase, the new normal was floating around my brain as the way to handle the situation. But then I thought, crap, that doesn't sound so helpful. Kind of meh. Then I thought, no way, I'm going to blow right past new normal and I'm going straight to mind-blowing. Mind-blowing transformation, miraculous metamorphosis. That new, short, practically bald hairdo that I had when the little sprout started coming in, oh my gosh, how chic and French. <laughs> Those gorgeous strapless dresses that I couldn't wear before, but now I can because now my boobs don't need a crane to hold them up. So glamorous. <laughs> that cute little skimpy t-shirt I can rock now that my nipples won't show through when I'm cold because 
I don't have any nipples. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I decided I was going to hold my arms wide open to the positive possibilities in the form of opportunities inherent in transformation. So in conclusion, my royal friends, it's been my honor and great pleasure to share some ideas and strategies for optimism and positivity from my book, Bonjour Breast Cancer, I'm Still Smiling. I hope you found them helpful for finding ways to live with positivity and to learn how to see with new positive eyes. Maybe reframe some things, maybe keep you from the dark. Uh, I, I, I hope you remember the uh, dash that everything as a process and its decision, action, strategies, and habits. And you know, there's a well-known study by a palliative care nurse, Bronnie Ware, who found that one of the top five common regrets of dying patients was that they didn't let themselves be happier. The study also found that patients didn't know that happiness was a choice. In this lifetime that I have, However long that it is or remains, I know it's my only one. And with my new eyes, I've made a decision to live joyfully, to spread joy, to live in the present moment, and to thread those moments together into days and into weeks and into months, and hopefully years, so that looking back, I can say without regret, Princess, you lived a happy life. Now, whatever challenges you face, Give yourself permission to be happier. I am here to tell you that even with breast cancer, happiness is a choice. Those deathbed regrets will never happen to you, my royal friends, because after tonight, not only do you know that finding your way to happiness is a choice, but I've pointed you toward the direction. I've shown you the North Star, and I've given you some some strategies to get there. So I bid you adieu. I wish blessings and good health. And as Princess Diane von Brainis ride, I order you to live your royally happy life. Carpe diadem. <laughs> <laughs> <And moi. laughs>